you know, when shipping's like 80 bucks or something, you yeah, know. Yeah, but if they're buying a big piece of art, if they're buying a big piece of art, I don't think that's going to be um, out of line for them, you know, and especially if you're charging 10, 15 percent um, on it. Now, if it's something that you normally would have had in your booth and you didn't have it, then that can be something you can maybe be flexible on and go like, well, I should have had it here. I didn't get it prepared. I'll cover the shipping cost on it for you. Or if they're buying multiple pieces from you, you can decide to do that. But shipping costs have been going up. And last year was the worst year I have ever seen for shipping yeah, costs. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And that's not probably going to go down anytime soon. So soon. So if you're covering shipping, you're either going to have to, I think, raise your cost of what you're selling or charge shipping. And of the two choices, I absolutely am in favor of charging shipping separately. Raise your artwork prices only when you have to, when you feel you have no choice to do so. And as to what you charge, I don't know. When I started out, I went around and looked at different shows, different artists in my medium, looked what everybody charged for similar size pieces. And I didn't want to be the bottom feeder. I didn't want to be, well, I'm new, you know, I'm going to charge the bottom price. I didn't feel arrogant or egotistical or confident enough to charge the top price. So I came in myself at about on a scale of one to 10, about a seven. And I think there's a lot of people that look at the price of what you charge and that's how they value it. It's like a Volkswagen can get you anywhere you want to go, but they're going to buy a Jaguar or something like that because they think it's a better car because they're paying a hell of a lot more for it. And I think a lot of times at art shows, they're, you're going to see that people are going to judge the same size piece from different people differently if somebody's charging thirty dollars for it and you're charging 200 for it they're going to think your piece is more valuable right or wrong i think that's how a fair number of people at art shows value I, artwork i think quality has something to do with it yeah but what about, what about my suggestion was try to have the same price listed on the website as at the show yes i okay. would agree i yeah i i I'm sorry to, do, to dominate, but I actually kind of know about this. Um, uh, no, I, I do. I have a degree in economics. I studied cost analysis. I know this. I don't do it myself, but I can give great advice. Anyway, uh, if you, uh, first of all, you don't know the price of your piece out in the real world at the art fairs. That's determined. It's supply and demand. So that's determined by the public. You could charge thousand dollars for something that you charged a hundred dollars for last week but you might not get it there's a price where it's called um it's called the uh, law of diminishing returns you go you take it to the point where the next dollar you're not going to sell anything you know so you have to determine what that is since you've never done it before you don't actually know the value of your worth compared to your competition at the show based on all these factors like uh, size, quality, price, you know, all, all this stuff that factors into it. Now, uh, if you, you, cost is important. So you're, you're, you talked about adding uh, because of the uh, cost, uh, traveling, all this stuff, which is ridiculously high. That's why I tell you to, well, you got to check while you're young, go do something else. Cause it's really a tough go, I think anyway, but, um, but having said, and I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, because if you like doing this, it's great. You know, I've been doing it forever. Um, so what happens is uh, if you determine what a price, like a higher end price, higher end for the, you know, uh, that you have to charge more, then on your website, charge that price also. You want to charge the same price. Right. It's and like, it, it, uh, it's, it's like when, when wholesale, when, when selling to galleries was really a viable thing when it was actually, for me, it was half my business. They were really conscious of, if I went to do an art fair in their city, their town, uh, that I wouldn't charge less than what they were charging. So in some ways that that worked for me because I had, I had raised my prices to match their price. I, I believe in that. You don't want to compete with people that, with yourself basically, or with, you know, you, you're selling. So, you're, so um, Ron was right. If you charge less on your website than at the show, uh, then um, you know then uh, there'll be a lot of uh, people, people are going to notice that. If you don't think they are, they definitely going to because they do. Yeah, it's kind of experience. like it's kind of like doing a show when you it's a speed bump that you're going to put in there for them to buy from you at the show. It's kind of like when you go to local art shows 
and people go, oh, where are you from? And they go, well, oh, you're local. Okay, give me your card. I can see you anytime. That's kind of a speed bump because good chance they, they won't ever contact you. So I think the less you can put speed bumps in the process of selling your artwork, the more, the more you're going to sell. And I think Barry made a good point too, that if you ever decide to do go through galleries, a possibility, just a thought, is that do a limited edition only through the gallery and let the gallery determine the cost so that even if it's higher than you would charge for your own work, it's only available through the gallery. Now, the gallery will have to, and it could be a small edition, 10 prints, whatever, but let the gallery sell that completely on their own. You can't get it anywhere else from you, so you have no price competition with what you sell for, because Barry's point was really well taken. But I think you, you know, when you see somebody say selling a 16 by 20 print matted in frame and you see eight different people at an art show selling that print you're going to see different prices there and you have to decide based on your costs and your valuation of what you do where you want to come out on that that price scale and that's going to be how much you value your work i think for the most part and like barry said quality but quality is a tough thing to measure i think in art you're measuring more people's reaction to your work and if you get good reaction to your work and people like your work, then the price you charge, unless you're the top seller at the art show, you probably do just probably do just fine. And you don't want to, yes, you don't want to start out too high and lower your prices later. I'd right? say so wherever you start, don't go backwards, only go up. Would you agree, Barry? Uh, yes. Um, I also want to make the other the point that when they come into your booth, you can give them a deal, you know. You can, it, it, nobody's going to know no, that. But... No, no, no deals. <laughs> I'm not saying off, who said that? <laughs> it was, it was me, Alex Well, we have Alex. different opinions about that, you know. Or only give a, or to me, I'd kind of be in the middle. Only give a deal if they're going to say buy multiple pieces. From I'm me. not talking about everybody. Yeah. I'm talking about on those rare occasions when you figure that a few bucks less might make the sale. I don't want anybody to walk because I can make another one. So I, I want to make the sale. Right. But there's Who another said, possibility there. There's another Who possibility there too. And that's to say, once they buy from you, they become a patron. And yeah. then you val then you give them discounts in the future because they No, no pay. discounts. Why are you <laughs> discounting? Because Who if they that? buy from Is you the Allison? first time at full price, you're gonna say, I value you buying for me. If you want to come back and buy another piece, Allison, will, lower your lower your cameras. I will respect. I want to see your lips moving. I will. I, respect I just you. I disagree. I you know what? When when people buy from me and they're long term customers, if anything breaks, I fix it for free. I yeah. can offer them free shipping, but no discounts on the work. And um, you devalue the work. That means it's not worth what you're charging for in the first place. That's my. I would opinion. disagree, uh, and that's that's a philosophy that that uh, Jason can consider. But I think it's valuing my customers that invest in me, and I'm going to say thank you for investing in me. If you continue to invest in me, I will I will respect you back, and I will give you a discount. Yeah, uh, but you guys are in totally different mediums. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I don't think it matters. Listen, if somebody if somebody has a piece of jewelry that broke five years after they bought it, you know, I'll fix it for free unless it's going to cost a lot or if they want a gold chain or. Yeah. But but I fix things. I am really good on the other end of that, and you know, I feel like that's they know what I, I had a customer. I don't know. It's probably seven years later. She wanted me to replace the chain because it was bent and, and it was a silver chain and and it was labor for me and some materials, but I did it um, for free and free shipping back to her and everything. And, and, and then recently she just bought a pair of earrings for me. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I just I feel like if you're selling the same thing that somebody else could buy, say, at a discount, then then I don't know. I, I, I also I feel that way about sales. I, um, I don't want people to feel bad that they spent money on something only to find out that somebody else got it on sale. I feel very sensitive but, but that's to that. Not what, but that's not what I'm saying. That is not what I am saying, Allison. I'm saying that if they invest in me as an artist and they invest in putting my artwork in their home or their workplace to enrich their home or their workplace, I'm going to say thank you for doing that and we're going to have a relationship going forward. 
that's how I treat two dimensional work. Maybe everybody will disagree with that, but that's what I've been doing for 20 some years and it works well. My patrons like being patrons and they like the fact that I respect them as patrons. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, not to say I don't respect my patrons because I have very long-term customers, but we just deal with it differently. Yeah, exactly. Great. And Jason can decide what philosophy he likes the best. How do you like do... Moral... Well, excuse How me, it? I'm sorry. Uh, one last thing. How do you deal with your work appreciating over time? So they would get well, a discount, but the piece might be more expensive? No, the only way that that works for me, because I'm not dealing with gold or silver or anything that has a market value price, is when I sell out an addition. Then mm -hmm. as I sell out the addition, then I can start charging more either as if I wanted to, as the edition almost clears out, but I don't because I figure that's the edition cost. I know other artists feel differently on this, but once the edition sold out and they start seeing the edition sell out or they see the edition down to its last few numbers, it's going to encourage them to buy. And no, I will not discount those when they buy. Mm -hmm. No, the first, the first purchase they make from me, and it has to be a fairly significant purchase, that's full price period. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the moral story is that you probably keep it consistent. Uh, yes. Yeah, because you don't want other people to ever find out that you gave somebody else a discount, but you didn't give it to them. What's the difference? Why did you give them a discount and not, you know, that's a bad place to find yourself. I don't think there's a good answer to it either. Besides the incentive of them buying at a show is they don't have to pay for shipping. Right. Great. Good point. I also include tax in my thing just because it's easier if you're dealing with cash rather yeah. than trying to figure out the 7.75% for San Diego. I'm, oh, dear, what is it here? <laughs> you know, 30 miles away. Uh, yeah, so some states have a added up at the end of the day and you know write down how much i owe the state well i mean figuring out sales tax is i mean if you use square or something it does it for you yeah, but that's right. besides well, the point like i said for cash right yeah but some some states have laws about that where you can't include the tax california has that law but if you say you're including it it seems to work okay uh, most of the small dealers at Comic Con's room do that because, again, they don't want to be working with change. The bigger publishers and so on with cash registers, yes, they charge tax on addition to whatever you purchase. But the other ones, you know, if they can work with just paper bills, that's fine. The, some of them just started taking credit cards last time they had it. So. Uh, but, you know, the BOE guys come through and say, hey, you have your number? And they check it on their little computer thing. If you do, fine. If you don't, you're out of there. You know, and it's also kind of hard when you hear on the news that the richest people in, in America don't pay hardly any income tax or anything. Well, that, sure they're not paying any sales tax, too. It's kind of frustrating. Yeah. So. Yeah, I can hear you uh, at the tax uh, assessors or whatever office going, hey, well. Um, <laughs> yeah, note to file. What, uh, uh, what's his name? <laughs> Why I can't think of any names. Uh, uh, you know, the Facebook guy. He doesn't Jeff pay Bezos. any tax, so I'm not going <laughs> to pay any either. Well, no, that's income tax. He's not. He's not. Oh, right. Well, that could be sales <laughs> too. Well, well, listen, the, the tax that they're not paying is legal. The whole tax system needs to change because they should be paying taxes. They're not doing anything illegal, though. Board of Equalization is just collecting sales tax. Okay. Right, <laughs> right. Okay, so Jason, what, what else now are you thinking? Are we confusing you or are we... No, I, uh, I really do appreciate it. The other thing I just... Uh... I can't decide on, and I wasn't planning on doing it. Is all my uh, prints in the booth were going to be open edition? Uh, I, I've, I've, I don't know. I, I lean. I feel like people are like, "Oh, you should be doing limited edition because it may increase the value of your pieces." I've never done limited edition, and again, I'm brand new to all this, so I just don't know if uh, 
if I should, if I'm making a mistake by not going limited edition. Yeah, you should. should you, I think you need to look at that one really hard. Uh, and well, I think Larry and Barry and others would agree. A lot of shows now are requiring limited edition. So you will basically, and that, yes, a lot of shows don't check to make sure their own rules are being actually followed. Well, Virginia Beach is the only show that does check. Uh, no, I, I believe some of the other shows do. Main I mean, Board. I've never additioned my work and I've never had a problem with any show ever. Okay. But you don't do open editions, right? Yeah. Well, you there's, do. yeah. That's no edition, is open edition. Okay. You don't number them. Nope. No, That'd no. be open. Yeah, no reason to. Well, you know, there are levels of shows. There's like this wide range from really bad, uh, uh, barely above um, uh, flea market to wow. very high level shows. And uh, it depends on which ones you get into and do. I would suggest not applying to the best shows right off the bat, although I did, <laughs> but uh, just to figure out what to do, because uh, you don't get in all the time. And once you get into a really, really good show, you want to be prepared. You, and you want to know your competition, which is very professional and top drawer. And, yeah. Though, and, uh, on the flip side of that, I would kind of say, encourage you to apply to the really good shows in your first year because your work <laughs> is due. And a lot of times that's yeah. what the jurors are going to go like, oh, my gosh, we've never seen this before. Right. It should be in the art yeah. show. And that will get you into a show. Yeah, that's right. It could push that bar up so high you'll get depressed seriously afterwards when you start doing <laughs> you all should. those other shows Barry's talking yep. about and that we end up doing which is like oh my god they suck but that joke could well be great you, you should have it's like a, it's like a joke and apply yep. to those that same list of shows every year right yeah but I would well, think then, there's, of, then there's emerging artists also that's a I've, way to I've, get in I've emailed some of the shows asking if they think I should go into emerging artists versus not some of them have actually said I shouldn't um, given that I already oh. have a boot set up, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, for the bigger shows, I could definitely use that as a medium. Well, they have, I've heard that if you do more than two shows, you can't apply in, as an emerging artist. Who's going to know? I thought it was by the year. I mean, you know, if you've done shows for three years or less, I mean, maybe, it, maybe the rules just depend upon per show. Yeah, it is. If you haven't done many shows, this is going to know whether you did one show or a hundred shows. Well, maybe a hundred shows, but yeah, um, one or ten, you know. Artists will turn you in. Okay, <laughs> going, going back for a second to the uh, limited editions, I think another thing that you'll find if you start looking into limited editions and you start looking to see if there's any standards by which limited editions are done, there isn't. They, that some people limit editions by size of the prints. So, and then some, like some of the fine art artists, uh, painters and stuff that have been out there for decades, did things like they do an edition of 1100 prints, they'd sell it out eight or 10 years later, they do the print again in a different size and they would say it was now a different edition. And so whether you're doing eight by 10s, 11 by 14, 16 by 20s, can you do each of those sizes in an edition, which then gives you, a, a, if the print's really good seller, you're gonna have a lot, a lot more prints out there. And if you change it, you sell out all your 16 by 20s and you drop an inch dimension on each size, you can go, oh, it's a new, it's a new edition. But it is something to at least think about. I get the reason. Are, if the shows write it in their rules, they do have the power if they want to check and maybe they never will, but if they do, they can throw you out of the show. None of the shows I'm doing this summer require it. Um, I'm in Colorado, but uh, I'm doing some shows in some more higher end areas like Aspen Vale, Telluride, places like that. So my thought process was given I'll be in more high end areas, the clientele there would potentially be more receptive to seeing a limited edition or that's just me. Oh, no, definitely. I would think. I would say so too, yeah. And plus, if you start with it open and later go to additioning it, you've got another problem, which is part of your addition is limited part is. And so I just make the decision from the start. And then it's I don't know about how you how some of you others feel. But for me to think of selling out 250 prints of an edition, while I have on a, a couple occasions getting close on a couple more, that's in 20, 25 years of doing art shows. It doesn't happen real often that you're going to do that. <laughs> But what about you, Larry and 
Why? Gary, what do you guys sell out editions very much? I never edition. What's an edition? Okay. <laughs> no, what oh, I all my pieces are, I wouldn't one say of one of a kind, but they're there's not any two that are the same. Okay. I might make the you know what I weigh out the I, I come from a retail background where I was a buyer and a seller. So uh way back before I was your age, Jason, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> 26. 26. Well, yeah, about that, about that time. Well, a little I was a little older when I got I was actually working in retail and hated it when I was your age. But anyway, so I weigh out the clay. So I would do like 10 pieces of a certain size. You know, they're all they're all different. They're all um I do a little different uh, cutout or a, a manipulation. And then the glazing's all, they're always different. Wow. So in some ways, yes, I'm doing 10 of the same thing, but on the other hand, they're all individual pieces. So it's different uh, than, than uh, you, you're doing photography. Yeah, mountain you're photography. You're pushing buttons. Yes. Uh, listen, you'll have to excuse me. I give the photographers a really hard time because you just push a button. I got to actually do physical yeah, wait, 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 wait. Wait. first you have to climb a mountain and then push the button <laughs> there you go yeah his work i would do different. i should have done that yeah and you also have to nowadays have to rely on the <laughs> fact that nothing oh. in the electronic system is going to change so that when you push the button next time something's not going to be different really There's nothing oh, we yeah. have electronically in life that stays the same forever it changes it goes out things things don't work and that's the same thing in printing through photoshop or printing on a large format printer things change yeah things change all kind of papers change all kinds of things change that aren't supposed to change a lot of times if you are doing a limited edition should you always be putting numbers on the front of the the piece or could you just put it on the back well or? there you go that's another good question i have I seen think myself bottom. people sign the mats which is to me not signing the artwork or you sign the artwork like a printer does or like a painter does yeah. So I suggest signing the art itself because if, it's, yeah. for example, you mat a piece, something happens uh, to the frame and they have to replace the mat, yeah. there goes your signature, there goes your numbering. Yeah. Hey, that's sign what I would do. Uh, yeah, I sign all the prints I sell on the back. You sign it on the back? Yeah. But I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm referring to the addition, let's say if you do 50 of something, so you'd say 10 of 50, 10 slash 50. Hey. That's what I would do. Everybody's um, different. On the front of it. I, uh, I won't mention the photographer's it. name, but we once bought prints from him at Ann Arbor that were numbered on the bag that the pictures were in. Yeah, well, that's what happened to Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach one time when they started coming around. People would go sign the plastic bag that the artwork was in <laughs> and, and addition it there, which was utter and complete French term bullshit. But they go, oh, okay, that's fine. Now it's a limited edition. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> not even close. I guess my only, maybe this is completely irrational, but I have two seven foot long metal panoramas that will be in my booth. I'm very clumsy. And I feel like if I take, I have a acid free pen, if I write, the, the limited edition numbering on these very expensive pieces, I would risk messing up the piece that's going to be front and center. Right on the boot. back. Yeah. Or yeah. you can you can get a, a, a tool to sign on metal on the back so that you don't ever need to worry about the signature leaving and the number. You could actually sign the digital file before it's printed and then have a different number for each print. What I've seen from mats, though, is like the artist will sign the mat, the picture or print has been signed, but they'll sign on the mat as well and do a little sketch on it. That's nice embellishing. But yeah. again, if that were to ever get damaged and the mat was damaged and had to be replaced, that would go away. So well, if the artwork is going to be signed, fine. yeah. But if you're a limited edition, signing artwork, I think, has to be the actual art itself so like a sculpture you can sign the wood base say that a piece of sculpture set on but you want to sign a piece of sculpture or if they ever change what it's mounted onto that's signing the artwork the artwork is the piece that you create somehow 
Even with earrings, um, your name is on both earrings in case somebody loses one. Yeah. Well, you're a pro, Allison. <laughs> I used everybody. to forget. I used to forget to sign my work, so I had picture uh, notes all over. Remember to sign work. An artful home requires it, so it kind of forced me into it. But I used to forget all the time. Did you have pegs made? I actually, um, I have a stamp with my initials, and for pieces that I can't get to that way, I could just use a um, like a little bulber on 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 this or. Um, or a Dremel or something. So I could physically sign the metal on the work. My handwriting isn't so great. That's why I have this uh, stamp with my initials. But also um, when you stamp the carrot of gold and the silver and all that, you're required to have some sort of maker's mark theoretically. I mean, in this country, it's very loose. Um, but in like Europe, you have to bring your jewelry to an assay office so they get tested. And, uh, so in any case, if I'm stamping sterling silver, I'm supposed to have some sort of maker's mark on it. Hey, what are the metal prices at, uh, like now? High, meet, or medium, or low? Um, let's see. Uh, silver has been you know, fairly stable. And um, gold, uh, oh, actually it went down. So gold is now 1840, which is, it's high, but I mean, it's, a uh, couple, like when when the the war in Ukraine started, um, it went up to like almost to two thousand. So so it's stabilized a little bit. Um, but I haven't had to order it for a while. And silver oh. actually went down. Oh, I'm surprised. Silver's been like twenty five dollars an ounce. I see now it's twenty one and change. Oh. Yeah. I think Jason probably experienced too in metal prints. I heard. Uh, a couple months ago, oh. prices went up about 30 some percent, 36 percent on metal. Right. Yeah. That's substantial. Yeah. Are they actually printed on metal? Aluminum. Well, they're printed every on, photo, on the aluminum, right? <laughs> yeah. Every photo lab I work with, yeah, the three different ones, they've all bumped it up in the last couple months. Is there any thought that's going to ever go down again, or is that a permanent? As far as you, what, what's your take on that? I don't see it going down, but I'm that also... has to do with your pricing that you're in charge for them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta, yeah, because now costs are much higher, so you gotta adjust your pricing. So, which brings me to two questions. Number one, how are the shows going? Do you think you're gonna do? Uh, uh, you know, is it gonna stay uh, good the way it's been? And two, does anybody besides me think that there's going to be a recession soon? Two questions. I think that's a manipulation by the Republicans, actually. <laughs> I'm okay. As far as the stock market going down and inflation and I'm all not talking this, about you know, the stock market. Well, well I, I think that affects our customers. Yeah. Well, I think general business, uh, the prices have gotten so high, the sales sales of everything are going down, uh, food prices, everything. So there's less money for anything. <clears throat> it hasn't really affected us or anybody yet, but it's. I'm noticing it here in our little town that there are already businesses going out of business. So oh, um, too bad. And, and the prices of things are insane. It's insane. You can't buy anything because it's it's crazy. Well, it's been people's experience at art shows. Our yeah. I, I just I just did Brookside in Kansas City, and in September they had it last September because of COVID. Normally it's in May, and um, it, in September it was really great. And this time round, um, the crowds were really good, and they were engaged. They weren't just walking by as zombies, but it was eh. And I've talked to other artists and. You know, we, we were all saying, well, the crowds are good, you know, and people are interested, but sales were not spectacular, see, it was not for me. And, you know, other people I spoke with, it, it also seemed to be just like, eh. I mean, I made some nice sales, but, um, but on the other hand, in conjunction with that, 
I also sold things on my website. So it's, you know, some shows are set up shows, in my opinion anyway, or, or for my work for the future, uh, where people see my work and it takes them a couple of times to buy it. So so the sales um, you're talking about that you made on your website, were those from Brookside or were they from? No, they were not related, but I can, I can make a guess that the email that I send out and the postcards I send out to my entire mailing list generate action in general. And the, maybe the idea that I'm doing a craft show, you know, puts people in motion, even if they're somewhere else. Uh, I, I can only guess at that, but you know, oh, you know, I like those earrings and she's going to do a craft show and I want to get them before they sell. Um, so I don't know. Um, I had, I uh, this is Erica. I had excellent sales at Arlington two weeks ago and the crowd was very receptive. And then I'm going to Alexandria this weekend. Good to see you again. You too. <laughs> good I, luck did, uh, I did Birmingham, Alabama, and I had a good show. Good. And, and a really strange experience. Tell us, Outside tell. of the show at night, apparently there was a gun battle with, um, with uh, automatic weapons, and it was only maybe 200 yards away. And uh, it, was, it was in the dark at night, so I didn't really see it but i saw the aftermath of the pol you could hear it and then the uh, the um the police uh, uh showed up and um and uh, an ambulance and a, tr and a, and a um a fire truck there was a, and a tow truck there was a whole bunch of things i didn't want to get near it um apparently they were drag racing i guess that's a thing now again oh. coming back from the 60s you know oh, 50s and where was this again Perry? Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, wow. So yeah. you have a bunch of gunshot holes in your art and people came in and go, oh, I like the textured look. Yeah, well, well I did I did duck down. I was sitting in my van. We had gone out to eat and had come back, you know, uh, and um, I was sitting in my van. I kind of, I can't actually dozed up because I, I was tired and uh, I hear this pop, 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 pop. Um, and I, uh, you know, I looked at, well, there's no errant bullets in my, going through my windshield, but I still kind of ducked down, you know, uh, and, uh, but I'd never, I'd never been close to gunfire like that ever, you know, so it was strange that it would happen near an art fair. So that well, was, that, uh, uh, is it still there in that industrial area with the train station? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I, I did, this is the second time I've done it, I, I, you know, even though I did well, I'm not going back. But here's the pro here's the thing. You know, you're talking about Brookside. She doesn't like me. What, what is the problem? You know, she puts me on the wait list and then ignores me every single time. And oh. having said that, my best um, compliment I ever got from any world class artist was from the uh, uh, Kent City Institute of Arts, Ken Ferguson. Who invited me to go to school there even and i did i didn't go because i was i was uh already had done 10 years of college i didn't want to go but um but i think but, you've probably seen what in the years you've been doing shows what i think some of the rest of us have seen is that the shows used to only put people on the wait list to the extent that there was likely a chance they would call people there's so many shows now that put so many people on the wait list they will never mm -hmm. ever 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 go that far down the wait list and the only reason that makes sense why they're doing that is they don't want you to get discouraged not to apply anymore actually yeah, I, I, I think i think it's since since mm -hmm. covid i think it's increased because people had to cancel i mean you know last year when the shows were rolled over i think they had to kind of fill boots so yeah, now so i think they're covering i've never been on so many matter. wait lists <laughs> That's right. But but years ago, before COVID ever hit the thing, one of the first signs I saw of that was Broad Ripple. They had 14 photographers in the category. They put 32 people on the wait list and only rejected six people. Now, there's no earthly way that you, you were beyond. And one year at Art Artisphere, I was number 16. I called them up. I said, how far do you typically go down your wait list? Uh, about five or six. 
So my yeah. odds of getting called were almost none. But I think oh, they're saying, fear. well, you know, don't get discouraged. We'll have new jurors next year. You were on the wait list this year. And that's deceptive. That's bad, bad promotion. If you're way down. Yeah, if you're well, way Artist down. Well, Artistry is one of those shows that you don't, you don't cancel. It's like, it's a, it's hard to get, really hard to get into. No, I was and, number three and, in Main Street Fort Worth one year, and they didn't even call number one off the wait yeah, list. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, and yet oh, yeah. this this year this year I know several people who got into Main Street off the wait list, like at least three different people. So well, maybe those categories were more flexible. Does happen? Yeah. I've gotten into Cherry Creek off the wait list in the past. I've gotten but into I've, Cherry Creek many times off the wait list. But I've never gotten into Brookside, whether I've been on the, rejected or on the <laughs> wait list. I, you know, I even talked to her. I talked oh. to her. And she said. I called her because I was out. I was that out that I was did Oklahoma City, and and it was like a week later. And I called her and said, "Hey, you know, I'm still on the wait list." Uh, and she goes, "Well, that's strange. We 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 almost put everybody that was on the wait list in the show. Uh -huh. right. Almost was the operative word, right? Right. So I <laughs> so I thought, okay, everybody, but uh, but okay, so I'm way down your list. Okay, so forget it, you know. Yeah. So Jason, do you have any more questions and ideas or thoughts or? going forward to your first show uh an endless, amount, an endless amount but i'm not here to uh take up everyone's time so oh, uh, throw some out would be i think all, most of us time are you taking i guess i don't know i feel like i have too many questions i don't know if there's like a uh, a single piece of advice that you you have for someone that's embarking on a, I, have, I have seven shows this summer which i almost feel like i've applied to too many but uh uh for someone that like something you wish you had known that beforehand um, or something you would have done differently for someone starting out. What are some of your, the, the questions that are of most concern to you about the shows? Are you doing a good job with asking them so far? What are the ones do you have out there that are real kind of concerns? Um, well, I was worried about inventory, but literally in the last week I've, I've, I've ordered all the inventory all needs. So I'll have a full, um, set up for the booth. I guess it's, you have a good booth. Uh, I mean, I've, I need to practice setting it up. I purchased a used a uh, light dome canopy about two weeks ago and I have a full pro panel set up. Uh, so good. I just need to, uh, get some repetition setting it all up. Cause it's just going to be myself initially. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I just don't know what I don't know right now. So I'm more, could you, I, could you take orders by the way, if you run out of something? Well, that's what, one thing I was curious about. I mean, I like you would just use, I mean, I can take orders at any time through my website, but you would just use Square or one of those payment uh, apps to, to take orders if that were the case. Well, do you sell off your walls or are you doing it where you're just exhibiting the work, the metal prints, and then they have to order them? Like, so like Allison saying, are you everything? So that's actually another thing. I wasn't sure. I initially was planning on doing, having it where they can just purchase stuff off the walls. Then an artist told me, well, you should just have, just keep the pieces on your walls because they're going to get wear and tear anyways and transport. So you, I'm actually going back and forth on whether I, I, I want to let people buy what's on the wall or just uh, kind of have well, it be off limits. I, I just want to make it as easy for someone to buy something. So I, I don't know, I guess if most metal really guys I know uh, take, just bring the samples and take orders Yeah, if and, and have a draft shipped. Yeah, if, if you're going to drop ship it, then have it shipped directly to the customer. Yeah. As long as you have the confidence, yeah, in the people that are doing your printing, that what right. the customer gets is going to look like what was on your wall. You yeah, and, and if they're local, I would I would drop it off in person, too, if they're open to that. Um, but so you would just take an order just like through on your phone through the app or, or through like Square or something like that? Well, you yeah. could, if you're at the show you know, they could just pay you in full for, you know, as they were, as you're making a sale regularly, unless there's something on square where you could place it as an order. So you have all their information. I, I don't know. Does anybody else? Uh, cause, cause yeah, he would need all their information. So, um, you know, when you're making a sale, if there's, I, I know on Square there's a place for notes, but if there's a place to um, put the customer's name and all that, then you could collect all the information right then and there. 
And I think she's got a good point too, because with Square, you don't ever get their email address. You have to ask them for it. And so if you write it down on an invoice, that way you'll always have it. Otherwise, Square is not going to give it to you. And a quick aside to think about, because I uh, took special orders at the show in Arlington, that um, Jason, if you do the drop shipping, which I do, um, then most likely the art's not going to be signed just in case you decide to go that route of limited edition. And if that affects your value scale, the fact that that work would not be signed as opposed to other work that is signed by you. I'm also a photographer. Well, I was gonna suggest signing in the digital file. Or the printing lab could just add the signature. Uh, Cause right now the printing lab does the digital signature for me on the metal prints. That's good. You could do it. You That's fantastic. Did you have to ask them about that or did they uh, give you that I, idea? I specify it whenever I place an order with them. I just like put in the order notes, but it's something they've done for other um, photographers, I guess. So I, I just mentioned they're like, yeah, uh, uh, we can do that. Um, okay. Did you just send it to them electronically and now they just have it on file and they'll add it as they process it? Yeah, so I have a digital signature. I just sent sent them the the image file, and they every single I've probably done it 20, 30 times. They just add a digital signature for me. But do they add a digital signature on the back or on the front? I have them do it on the front, the bottom right corner. Okay, because otherwise, Larry's suggestion is good: is to di digitally sign the image so that it's your as close as possible your signature and your numbering on it. Yeah, I also have to go back and forth on that. Um, I guess the reason this is all weird to me is I've never, the only way I've taken orders is through my website. I've never actually uh, like transacted with someone in person, if that makes sense. Uh, well, you could get the chip, the chip reader and use Square and take a cell like that in person. But, yeah. you know, if you're taking orders, then you have to have some mechanism in which you remember. Now, when I go back to Square and I look at my transactions, uh, the person's name is on there. So, yeah. um, you know, like when I go to, to input the numbers on my spreadsheet for my sales, you know, I go to transactions and I can um, look at the actual, that specific sale. I can, it separates out the sales tax. So I can input that separately. And then the customer's name is, is on there as well. So, but you'd need another way to take that customer's name and have their address and all that as far as what they're ordering. Uh, there is a place for notes. I always forget about using it. Um, but when you, when you first take a sale, there's like a little window for notes uh, where, you know, you could at least put in some information, but, um, but yeah, just directly. Uh, do you, do you have a chip reader? No, but I have it. I, I can definitely easily get that set up. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's it's it's all very easy, actually. And um, you just want to make sure. Like what I do is the day before a show, I always look at Square, make sure it's still running, because sometimes mm -hmm. the chip reader gets unsynced and uh, yeah. just things like that. And uh, this way, and then the morning of the show, check it again. <laughs> yeah. Make the battery, sure the app is up to date. Right. <laughs> Right, you exactly. Know. Make sure everything's up to date. Um, well, you know, because they, you know, every week they or every couple of weeks they uh, they improve the the app, so they they change it. There have been times when it's not working, and I go, I can't have this here. And then you go, then I go look, and you know, I just need an update. So anyway, it's good. It's good to have a little swiper with you as well. Just that's right. Case. Yes, that's right. Um, I've but done you're that too. you're. You were asking about all like you know other advice. I, I, I find it important to have things that make me comfortable. Um, so uh, I always have a cooler with food, snacks, easy to eat. Um, uh, because it's hot in the summer, um, none tablets, which are electrolytes, they uh, they come like ten to a little container, and you can put it in your water bottle. And if you're drinking water all day, those help revive you. Um, there's a lot of little things that I'm sure everybody has their own specific things that they like to have with them. 
And uh, so maybe other people can chime in about those little comfort things. Um, I got a couple essential things that haven't been mentioned. mentioned. Stabilizer bars for your booth. Yep. I think that's really important. And proper weights. Because I've had booths. I've had booze next to me blow over and, and knock mine over. So it's happened at once was devastating and once was just a minor thing, but I hate did, that. <laughs> Jason, did your light dome, did your light dome, did it come with stabilizer bars? Yeah, well, I purchased um, extra ones through pro panels where you can actually attach the panels, connect them to the light dome canopy as well, which is supposed to help a little bit with stabilization. Now the stabilizer bars are the bars like at the top, but around the bottom on three sides. Yeah, around oh, the wait. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes, it does. It did come with those. Perfect. Um, I was thinking of what Erica has in her boost shot, those stabilizer bars that go across the pro panels. No, it's, I, I, especially with a, unless they change the design, the, um, you know, your tent that you use. Jason, what tent did you buy? Oh, it's a light dome canopy. The, yeah, the light dome. I, I've seen them sway, you know. They haven't gone over, but I've seen them sway. Stabilizer bars will keep them stable and keep them from swaying. And you got to have at least, and it's a, it's debatable the amount, but I have 45-pound weights on each on each leg, and that works for me. My, yeah, they don't, don't make my have, tent anymore. I don't even have weight. So I need to. It's a tent. Huh? Okay, look, look at tra um, John Deere tractor weights. Yeah, yeah, they're great. They're True. like 47 pounds and they come with a built in handle. Yeah, wow. that's what I would have if I, I have um, uh, Happy Feet. They don't make those anymore, but th those are 45 pounds. And, oh, uh, those are great, those Happy Feet. I've seen those. Yeah. Happy it's Feet weights. But they stopped making them. Great name. I'd suggest that you take a picture of your booth when you get it set up. And then once when you're nearly done and when you go home and look at things, you'll see things differently than you do in real life. Yes. Good suggestion. Do you Plus, have uh, business cards? It's funny. I have a I'm ordering those literally in the next day. That's one of the very few things that I have left uh, that I do not have right now, but I will make sure I have those before the first show. How do, Look you, at, how do people, people feel, all the artists here, about getting those scan codes that people, if they want to scan it with their cell phones and can get your website and contact information, is that a plus minus? How do people feel about that? Does it work? I've been wondering. I, I see people with it. I, I personally don't. It. I don't know. I mean, you can I'm not doing it. Depends on the market. Q, QR code. You could put it on. I'm not the, doing it. You I've had put it, it for on years, your years and it doesn't your really business. doesn't work well. Well, it it goes right to website unless you save it. It's not. It They're just not goes. It, it opens it up right then and there. Is how okay. it works. But so unless they that, save it, if you don't save it, you lose it. Okay. So well, I was I actually did it for years when they first came out, but I don't I no longer do it. Some people have one on their business cards. But would that be the same thing if you scan it and they don't save it, then it's not going to be oh, there. They, they still have your business card though. Well, but it's then just a fast need... way to get to website. Yeah. Right then in there. Instead of typing it in. I was actually gonna put a if I'm able to. Well, number one, put it on the back of the business card. And number two, somewhere small on the pro panels, put a sheet of, I don't know, maybe paper where they can actually scan uh, as well, just as another medium for them to get to the website. Again, that, that may be a terrible idea, but that was one thing I was going to at least try out. I find it's it to not be a distraction. Idea. Worth trying. Yeah. It, it, you know, what's a piece of paper? Sure, do it. Somebody will be maybe use it, but don't rely on it. Yeah. Oh, uh, a mailing, mailing list sign-up sheet. You know, not everybody's gonna buy your work who sees it, but they might love it and they forget who we are as soon as they get home. And, um, you know, I, I would collect uh, email. I collect snail mail too, but you know, emails 
And uh, once, once I'm done with the show, I send a thank you to all the new people who signed my email. And it's just a way, even if you just send out an e-news or something quarterly or something, it reminds people who you are uh, because there are people who, you know, three months, six months, two years from now might be interested and you're just reminding them who you are. You just do that via pen and paper or you do it electronically? Well, I've thought about doing it electronically, but um, when they write it down and they leave my booth, I write little notes on it as far as what they were interested in. So then I can be very personal uh, about, you know, oh, you know, you were looking at these earrings, you know, I could always make them for you, whatever. And I could be more specific. Um, one of the things I try to do, you know, because we're artists, we're individuals, we're not large corporations, you know, how can we compete? Well, I feel like we can compete by making it personal. So even with the emails I send out, it's not generic, I'll be at this show. I, I try to, you know, have a warm message of some sort. Yeah, I, I, I love that idea. I guess the only tricky part is, at least in my, my mind, my setup was going to be a 10 by 10 setup with pro panels and then two pro panel uh, print bins where I'd have uh -huh. a bin print. So I, wouldn't, I wasn't planning on having like a, a pedestal or a table where I would have pen and paper available. Right. So I'm sure I could, I could figure that out. I mean, does anyone else have ideas of another I'm, way? I'm doing something new. Um, Hewlett Packard made a, a portable printer called the Tango. Uh, actually, they didn't make it. Apple made it for Hewlett Packard. And um, they, they stopped. Uh, Hewlett Packard doesn't sell it anymore. They discontinued it. You can buy some. The only place you can really buy a brand new one is at an Apple store. And Hewlett Packard has a program called um, Infinite Ink, where they will they will send you ink for for uh, whatever whatever price you want to pay per month. They'll send you uh, cartridges. So, um, but the, but with the Tango, um, five by sevens or six by nines uh, in color they will send you unlimited ink and, and only charge you the, the, so I signed up for a dollar. Okay. The dollar, <laughs> the dollar amount, which if you, if you're doing a um, uh, normal eight and a half by 11s, that's, you can only get 10 a month, but with these little, with these cards. Okay. So I just ordered the cards. I just got the printer. I'm going to take the printer with me to the show. It's wi it's a Wi-Fi printer. So uh, you have to have kind of a setup. You have, first of all, you have, to, you have to plug it in. So you need electricity. You also need a, a Wi-Fi connection, which, uh, you know, you have a hotspot on your phone. So uh, my plan is to, uh, to when somebody comes in the booth and they see something they like and they say, well, I'm going to walk around or I want to show my husband or whatever. I quickly take a, a photograph uh, uh, on my phone and... Um, and, and there's an app and it'll send it, it'll send it to the uh, printer and print the, the, the picture of the image of the other piece. So that uh, if they're, if they're coming to me at the beginning of the show, they have this card and they walk around and uh, then they can either come back or later on, they can say, Hey, I really like this piece. I wish I had gotten it. You know, it, it's just a better reminder than somebody saying, Hey, uh, you know, I, I, you know, they forget by the time they're at the end of the show, to come back or they're too tired so even if it only counts for one or two extra pieces extra sh sales at a show it's gonna be it's worth it to me i'll be Another curious idea. to hear how that works yeah me uh, too <laughs> yeah you can tell us show us next time you're another um, idea wait. thought though is to get when you do business cards don't do them standard business size get them larger put some of your imagery on them so people can be reminded kind of along the lines of what barry and others are saying is People can tie you to your work on that business mm -hmm. card. So a four by six or a five by seven, it's hard yeah. to lose. It almost becomes like a piece of art. They can put it up on their refrigerator with a magnet or whatever, but they yeah. can also see what your work is. And they go, oh yeah, remember we saw this at the, and if there was yeah. a way to do something like that with what Barry's talking about, where you could actually print images that they're interested in seeing, 
course, you have to get another little tabletop for your booth. But. Um, Jason, what about what about um, if you could Velcro um, a mailing list, you know, on a, a clipboard or something to the side of your booth, maybe where your name is with a pen hanging from it? Could something like that work? Totally. We yeah, no, I, I, I forgot about the fact I already ordered a whole row of Velcro from Pro Panel. So that's definitely oh, something I could, okay. I could do. And then, like, there, you know, people might see it and sign up on their own. But if somebody's very interested and they're clearly not buying right then, you could suggest to them that, you know, keep in touch with me, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, so, I mean, I, I don't, I don't ask every single person who comes to my booth, but, um, but you know those interested, in, it's it's a reminder. I mean, so many times I'll see somebody with a pair of earrings. I said, "Who made those?" And they could never remember. And so, you know, it's this way you could send them reminders of who you are. Yeah, I think that the hard just another you know, thought though, wall space as we know for two dimensional artists is uh, valuable, and giving right. up wall space for anything else, make sure it's something that's going to give you something very worthwhile back for what you're going to give up because that right. spot may hold a piece somebody wants to buy or would buy at the show yeah well maybe towards the bottom or something less you know more out of the way or if there was an app that you could get on your phone they could put it in on you know give mm -hmm. email the 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 last thing uh that I, I still don't have and i guess need to get is i don't even know i think some shows may not even allow it but a sign I don't have any type of sign saying my name and anything like that. Um, I, I don't know if, if people in here have like a make your own, like with one, as one of your prints. Yeah, Good I know idea. you can do like a metal sign with your name on it. Or this still print. Some, yeah. some have awnings above above the top of their tent that's done on a fabric that kind of goes on any kind of a little awning pole that comes out and it stands upward. It's like a an L shape that comes out and goes up and then they have a banner across it too. Or, you, it, well, you'd have to have a table, but there's ones that hang off the edge of a table. I was thinking of putting one on on my, my print bin, on the front of the print bin. Uh, it's not super big, but 30 inches wide. Mm -hmm. Or could a, sign, could a sign be like at the top of your booth? Um, you know, something more narrow and long? What I have, I have, I have one that's maybe six, six or seven feet across. Yeah, because when people in, walk walk shows, then they could in the, at the distance they could see, you know, maybe your name with the word photography or something like that. My thought process was my huge because I'm going to have like two eight foot long metal panoramas. My thought process is those are in a way my signs, uh, since mm -hmm. no one really knows who I am since I'm brand new. <laughs> And I've seen over the years, some artists that actually get like a pole that comes up along either pole on the front of their booth that goes up higher than their booth. And then they put their sign on that. So um, as Allison was saying, you can see it from a distance and they go like, where was his booth? Oh, there, you know, there's his sign. There's his name. That's it. Well, whatever you do, the, the, the difference between the first show and the second show is going to be dramatic. So I wouldn't do too much. I wouldn't worry about it and I wouldn't do too much. Uh, for me, I fell flat on my face on, at, at my first show, and I'm really glad that it rained for two days because that it the, I, mean, I definitely wasn't prepared, and the difference between the first show and the second show was huge. So um, the, the rain it, helped me out. But it sounds it sounds like you're on a great track. I mean, you sound prepared. So uh, what about how are you at selling? <laughs> uh, I mean, I used to work in finance and sales. Oh. I don't know. I'm very like friend. Yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out. I, I love talking to people. I can be gregarious and uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. It'll be an experiment. You know, just, just be authentic. Sounds like you're going to do just fine. Smile a lot. I should say, do what I say and not what I do. Because sometimes if, the, if it's really cold, the weather's bad, it's raining, people are annoying. I'm not my, I'm not my happiest in the booth. So, you know, and then other times I'm, uh, I, I could, I should be a stand-up comedian. 
you know i should be on stage because i'm so you know funny and engaging you are right now well it's like now you know it's like in my booth it's just like that the other thing I don't even have, which again, I feel like there's a million things to get is uh, like, if you look at Erica's booth setup, I don't know if she has lights that go to illuminate the artwork. I don't even have a light like bar set up yet. I don't know if most, most people do without electricity, do with it. I know you have to pay extra for some shows. Um, well, well, what are the hours of your shows? That would be one thing. They're like I mean, standard, I think like 10 to, to five or. Oh, that's great. I think, yeah. yeah. You have to be aware of like five to nine or whatever, like uh, like Des Moines, so that you need the lights for at night. Otherwise, you don't necessarily need the lights. Although there are people that have lights during the day too. It, it, it I think it helps, but uh, it, when it's 95 degrees out, the, you know, you don't want, it's hard to have lights. It's hot yeah. enough without. And part lights. of that will be dependent on where they put you. If they put you under a tree, right. so you have nice shade and it's kind of dark and it right. can't work yeah. really well, then it would be nice. Maybe as people are saying, talk to some artists as you on your weekends off. Um, go to some shows and see how people work with uh, battery systems and lights and see what options are out there. Because yeah, if you could carry a battery system with you and a few lights just in case. Or if it's really overcast and dark and it looks like it's going to be tornadoes and stuff like that and you want to light your booth up a little bit during the day, it's a nice thing because people can see your work better and it will help it sell, I think. Do, Would you guys agree? Does Jason, anybody just have a, feel, free to, feel free to DM me. I can answer your question. Has anybody uh, uh, bought, you know, talk about the, you know, the uh, battery units. There's, there's ones that are, you know, they have 1,000 watts, 1,200 watts, but then there's those are relatively expensive, but then there's some that are around 300 watts. Has anybody had an experience with the lesser, the lower wattage? Well, you mean with the battery system that runs it, that runs it or the lights that go into the battery system? Uh, well, just, the, just using one in general. I mean, yeah, I, I would I, think I, lights. I just use a motorcycle battery for my lights, but you know, when you have 300 watts yeah. and they're LEDs, you could still have a lot of lights. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I think I would only turn them on at night, you know, like at uh, as the sun's going down, maybe. Well, another thing o'clock. you might want to consider, because when Barry brought up that, you know, summer hot temperatures, is um, battery-operated fans like Ryobi or oh, yes. those that can run all day on be recharged just to give some coolness to people coming into your booth. Um, is a big, big plus because boosts will get hot. And if you don't have a vent in the top, the heat will start to build up. So, yeah. And I, know I always want to try one of those portable air conditioners. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if it works, yeah. It's tempting. I know if it would work, the air conditioning is better than a fan. But even if it's 10 degrees in the booth, you know, cooler than outside, it definitely would help. I mean, I've done some shows where people couldn't wait to get out of the booth because it was so hot. That's right. You know? And with the but, portable fans, again, seeing how other artists do it, some artists will hang the fans from their rafters um, off of bars so that you're blowing the hot air kind of down to get it out. You're not pulling up dust onto your artwork. So those are some other things to kind of go explore in the months to come. Well, the other thing to find out is, you know, the shows you're doing, each one will be different. Do they have booth sitters? If so, you know, they have some systems set up usually. Um, and, uh, you know, some shows are better than that than others. So, uh, you know, that that's just something to, to explore and to know about. Definitely. I got to go, guys. Bye, Shirley. Bye, Shirley. Bye. Bye. I feel bad. I've uh, I've I've hogged this conversation. No, you haven't. No, and we all. I've hogged, I've hogged the conversation. Me and Ron <laughs> and Allison. Great feedback, though. But if the, yeah, because I think we all started out somewhere along the line. We all started out as as newbies, and anything that our experience can do to help you get started, I think we're more than happy to spend the time 
trying to help you get off the ground or anybody get off the ground. You're lucky we're not uh, judging your work. We we're not judging you, by the hour. That, we might make you cry. Yeah, it's not very good. By telling you the well. truth. Actually, you did during the mock jury. Oh, yeah, that is oh, true. Real, his work? Yeah. No, we just, we, uh, we, we, ju we, we, we juried uh, um, the booth image, the booth, and what else? Uh, uh, oh, and their uh, artist statement. We didn't say anything about people's work. That is so not true. <laughs> get him, America, get him. Really? <laughs> Wait a minute. Did I say, never mind. Uh, I don't want to say anything. Did I, did oh, I say anything? This is being recorded. America. Look, uh, the play the oh, we're back. fine with that. Right, come on. So, so what, what, what did I say about you, Eric? Erica? You said that I was a cliche. I did? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. No. I love it. No. I'm gonna go make a read to take the pain away. Ow. Not, <laughs> not, not I think, well, in the I think all most photography at art fairs are a cliche. It's about <laughs> it's like what I did on my, my summer vacation. I mean, look, look, I'll give you an example that you know that you know about and you might agree with it. It seems like at one time, I, I don't I don't see this much anymore, but at one time every every photographer had went to Tuscany and did the flowers over the over the arch every single one it was i think i think it was i made jokes about well it must be obligatory you can't do a show unless you, you can't do an art fair unless you have that one image yeah they still uh -huh. do and the and the crazy thing is they still get juried into shows on a regular basis yeah. Yeah. which means no no, no. all i know all i know look you can you see this glass I, you've driven me to drink barry that's all i cool. know that's great. <laughs> Hey, I can't wait to have one with you. <laughs> if you're doing uh, uh, Alexandria, so you're doing you're doing Howard shows, though so it's possible that we might see each other at a show. We can. I'll hang out with you. I'll go have drinks. I'll even buy the drinks <laughs> to make up for it. Jason, anyway, it sounds like you're you're on the right path, and you've got a good you know tent and all of that. And you'll also learn a lot from your neighbors at show. I every single time I do a craft fair, I, I learn, you know, something from other artists at the show always. So um, that's that's valuable. Hopefully, you'll all be too busy, but um, you know, as far as lighting, you know, just just be observant at the shows that you do. Who has lighting and and see what they're doing, especially you know in photography. If anybody's interested, I put the link to the Comic Con art show for this year in the chat. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And uh, at the bottom of the page is the application if you want to see how they did it. This has been, uh, I don't know, tweaked by whatever legal team is now part of Comic Con. So some of it's sort of like, what? <laughs> but uh, just to give you an idea of what it's like. So maybe you can answer a question about that. I always think that doing those events like Comic-Con and, you know, that they have their, their own thing, but do something. So they set up a thing. Oh, it really, really great. Oh, that wouldn't it be great to have a bunch of artists here. It's not the main focus. Is it? A, I would think it's a waste um, of time. It used to be a lot more important in that a lot of comic artists, cartoonists and so on, illustrators even, would get their start there. Because I can they see that. Have, they, they would have it on the same floor as the vendors. So they, you know, when they're like applying to places for illustration or, you know, art jobs or lettering or whatever, they could say, oh, I have some stuff up in the art show. Why don't you take a look? take a look and, you know the guy would take a break at a certain point go up there look at it and you know that would be sort of like their portfolio now however they stuck us out in Siberia so it's like a 20 to 30 minute walk depending on how many other people are on the sidewalk so no guy ha is going to have enough time to take an hour out of you know the time at, at the booth this is a trade show as well as a 
uh, fan-based event. There's yeah, professional it, meetings yeah. and stuff there. There's portfolio reviews and uh, that type of thing. But the art show is very broad in what or in who exhibits. There's pros that have, you know, $1,500 paintings up. And then there's uh, kids whose parents have bought them a panel and they have, you know, their things on uh, their notebook paper sometimes that they've uh, put on a mat and hung up and they get to say, I'm in the art show. <laughs> Great. So it, it's highly variable. And does that work for if you have more serious work? Uh, what do you consider serious? If it's within the themes, yeah. There's one lady, she, she gets four panels each time, which is the maximum. And she sells yeah. pretty much out. Yeah, she I wasn't referring to being in the theme because that's logical. I'm just talking about like the like a typical art fair with you know with artists, which wouldn't be in the theme. Well, the thing is, for the Comic Con show, it's like a gallery. It's like a pop-up gallery in a way, in that you don't stay there with it, and you could actually mail it in, and oh. the staff hangs it. Yeah, see, I would never do that. But uh, if you're there in person, you can hang it and say bye. They take care of security. They take care of the sales. They take care of the sales tax, and uh, sounds like a good venue for people who it works for. You yeah. know, as an as yeah. an alternative to to these shows, I mean, you know, there there are people who've come up. With, I've got a friend that does um, knitting shows, uh, or textile shows, and you know, it's a good niche. She could sell her jewelry because yeah. it's made of felt and silver, and and those sorts of things are could be golden because there's not that many. You know, it, it may be more people in the theme of what the show is, but um, just a few outliers could do really but well. The other thing so. is they can mail in their art to something like, you know, Comic Con or Dragon Con in Atlanta, which I believe is in August, and do another show on that weekend where they're there in person. So, you know, certain amount of inventory wouldn't be able to be sold either place, but you know, what, what is there can be sold. And you know, you're just paying for shipping. So there, there are people that, there's a couple of people that have things in town in galleries or whatever, and they still put something up at the Comic-Con one. And uh, it used to be that people that were selling in Artist Alley or at some of the small press booths, as they're called, uh, would have, you know, something up in the art show and then on it says, come and see me at table such and such or booth such and such, you know, at the convention. Hey, does anybody here ever do any of those, uh, like, barbecue shows or beef and barbecue or Joe's... Uh, Joe's uh, plumbing and heating shows or you know they, at least well, i mean i can't give you huh? the home shows i can't i can't give you any names because i immediately ignore them but does anybody do any of those other theme shows that have that think it's a good idea to have an art fair you know alongside it does never anybody been. do those never, if it ne would really fit into the theme of the people there i i've seen it done at horse shows where they'll have you know a barbecue set up and a few booths but you know you you sell horse themed stuff there okay i can see I, that i tried hot air balloons yeah no That'll i create. did too total disasters weren't they yeah they only buy hot air balloon pictures if they know who owns the balloon <laughs> oh and most of the time, they walk from the parking lot to see the balloons take off. They walk right back to their car. And I'm where's here. Luciano? I, we need to ask Luciano. He wasn't he the king of selling hot air balloon photos? No. Yeah. But time. then there's like those uh, home and garden shows. Um, yeah. You know, I've known ceramic artists, uh, jewelers, um, 
you know, they're, they're architectural type shows. So they're kind of high end. And if your work fits a garden theme, you know, mm -hmm. it's another, you know, kind of odd venue where it's not going to be all artists that, that, you know, might, might give, you know, with the right work might give somebody good, a good amount of attention and sales. But well, does, does it attract customers? <clears throat> the Pennsylvania Guild has an established craft section at the Philadelphia Garden Show. Ah. And they've been doing it for years, so it, it works well for them. I can see that. Meaning people come specifically to buy there <laughs> because they know that they're well, going to they, they expect see something art to be there to buy. Uh -huh. The dog show here usually has uh, some craft or art uh, booths that yeah. are selling paintings. But I think like Barry's saying, that. like there's a, a, a website called uh, Events in America, I think it is. And it's become, it, it used to have some art shows, mostly it's indoor shows, I think like Barry's asking about. But given the cost of going indoors, which is usually a lot more expensive, it's got to pay off all the more to work, right? If you're paying seven hundred dollars, like what is the the guild, Larry? Do you have any idea what the booth is in that guild part? No of idea. Yeah, because most of the indoor shows I've seen are like seven hundred dollars. Well, it's expensive because they let you share a booth too. Hey, outdoor shows are outdoor shows are seven hundred dollars. I, just I was heard... just going to say that newsflash this year. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah, but I, I heard um, Ace Indoor Show, American Craft Exhibition. The booths this year, I, I didn't even apply to it. The booths are $1,200 to $2,500. Yeah. Yeah, great. Let them have it. From, a, you know, from an artist business perspective, you know, you're talking about risk reward. And so you have to, you have to add up all your expenses and uh, and let's and you can't assume you're going to sell anything. So your risk is that that amount. So if you're spending twelve hundred dollars on a booth, and then another, uh, you know, hotel rooms are ridiculous. So let's say five days at one hundred and seventy-five, and that's probably an expense, not even expensive. That's so then you got eight. another thousand there, huh? That's hotel eight here. <laughs> That's another, you know, and then food Cherry, and then. Well, Cherry Creek is outdoors and it's at least 850. Yeah, I yeah, wouldn't want to give Cherry Creek a try because it goes to your, the other questions, aspects, is it your market and do they have a history of drawing buyers? And yeah, I think all of us wouldn't mind paying 800 or $1,000 for a booth at a Cherry Creek, Main Street, Fort Worth, St. Louis, Plaza. That's right. Because your potential for for being in front of an audience that's going to really respond to your work is powerful. It's way up there. Would you agree? Well, the, are you kidding? I would pay, I would pay, you know, 1500, you know, to do the Smithsonian craft fair for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's Although, interesting though. Yeah. There are people that, that uh, zero out there too. So uh, that's, I was just going to say that like Fort Worth, I've done that a couple of times. I even won an award and I didn't zero out, but it wasn't really, it wasn't worth it given, you know, the, the, the travel and, and the amount of days and all that for me, but, you know, some shows, you know, can work great for other, like for me, slower shows are better than that's the most crowded show I think I've ever done. And it's a very nice yeah. show. Yeah. So, you know, I would never say to anyone not to do it. But for two Sometimes, dimensional work, I think almost without exception, if you're talking to artists, the best shows they've ever done in their career are the shows like Des Moines, like St. Louis, like Cherry Creek, hands down, don't get anybody, closer, right? Anybody besides me doing Des Moines this year? Here? I didn't apply. It's the only good show I got into this year. I mean, of the top shows. Must be all these new artists like Jason that are just eating up the spaces. Come on, Jason, pony up. Well, like one, one thing I was curious about is I've only, I'm only doing like mount shows in mountain towns in Colorado because my, my work is all mountain photography. You would, if I'm ever fortunate enough to get into any of those top shows, I mean, all I have are pictures of mountains. I mean, you oh, think don't that, worry about it. Don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. 
you want your images to reflect you and if you if your thing is the mountains yeah don't don't change what you're doing for the show or whatever. Oh, he sells, so I'm going to do what he's doing. Don't don't ever do that. Yeah, do your uh, own pieces. Park Park City's on the west side. Cherry Creek's on the east side. Those people that come to the mountains, Snowmass, all those maroon bells, all those, they have money and they come from all over the country. So it's like the year I yeah. did Sausalito. There were people there from all over the country. They wanted the work shipped to them, but they had no hesitation about paying the cost they didn't bargain yeah, great. at all it's just like oh it's two thousand dollars yeah i'll take it uh can you ship it to me yeah how much you charge for and they didn't even ask how much you charge for shipping they just assumed whatever you wrote down was what you charge for shipping and people who live in cities you know they go to the mountains so you know the idea is right it's your work and you know people relate to it they don't have to um you know, necessarily live in that particular place where you're photographing. Yeah, like how many people have bought those, like when Barry was describing those European scenes, how many people have bought those and never been to Europe or maybe went on one cheap cruise, but they buy, they buy it anyway. So yeah, if you're, I think part of it and the same as with advertising, it's being in front of an audience that has, that defines, I think they call it your avatar that they're your buyers, that it defines who the people are that have the money, the wherewithal, and the interest to buy your work. And if they have big wall spaces, they need a seven foot piece. There's not a lot of artists out there they are gonna offer that. And there's a lot of people that are gonna love the mountains. So don't worry about it. The other thing, uh, uh, Jason, a, a friend of mine who started out as my mentor, she told me, never assume they're only buying one. You mean at like at that time or that as like through time? Well, okay, both. But I mean, at that time, yeah. you know, I, I mean, there are people who, you know, like three pieces of yours and they could see them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all together. And so, um, you know, I, I mean, we don't want to be pushy or anything, but, you know, I don't know, a thousand dollars. To, to me is very different than a thousand dollars to my customers. So, um, so yeah, that that's what I mean. Yeah, because actually, what she's describing, I saw I was next to a jeweler at a show out in California, and that's exactly what happened. They came up, they liked the necklace. Oh, we like this necklace. How much is it? Well, it was twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, we'll take that. Ooh, ooh, and then they start looking. Ooh, that bracelet. How much is that bracelet? That goes great with this necklace. Blah blah blah. It was another seven hundred dollars, and then she was writing it up. Like, oh, oh, those earrings. Oh, those earrings. Yeah. Would be great. And next thing you know, they'd spent like twenty four hundred dollars. Boom, just like that. With wow. One and <laughs> like, so she's right. It, although well, I think with two D work, there's going to be more of a tendency for people to go identify the pieces multiple pieces they're interested in yeah that's good advice that um allison uh, i experienced that in arlington because um um though still relatively new to shows but um so it was something that i didn't think about and so uh now collector came in and had interest in one piece large. And my approach was, you know, I wasn't trying to upsell her or anything. So I just left it at that. But then her eyes were just lingering on another piece. And she said, you know, I think I really need that one. And then if I get that one, then, well, I just need to do three. And then by the time she left, she <laughs> said that her wall in her home office the one that you see behind her on her Zoom meetings will just be the Erica wall. So she started with the triptych of three, and then she says she's going to build from there. That's, That's great. great. <laughs> yeah, and also sometimes you can see like uh, with what we do in two-dimensional work, they'll be looking, say, at two matted pieces, and then they say, well, we could do three of them, and they, they pull out three of them, and they're not sure exactly which ones go best where you can step in and go, well, you know, a possibility, and this comes from designers, not from us, well, you could do a bigger one in the middle and a smaller one on either side, and you can kind of show them, well, you, they could stack the two on the side, they could, and they can put them at an angle, they could fill up bigger spaces, and all of a sudden they start going, oh, yeah, we hadn't thought of that. Oh, that would be good. And next thing you know, you're up selling at least one of the three pieces. 
So let, me add to, let me add to what Ron is saying, because that is what happened. She wanted the one in a large piece. And then she said, well, what do you think might go with it? So that's yeah. another question that I wasn't necessarily used to being prepared for, but I have my website. So I flipped out my phone and I said, how about this? And she goes, <laughs> I love it. And then I went to another one on my phone from my website. These photos were not in the shop. They're on my website. And I said, how about this? And she was like, I love that. I want them all. So um, even though I didn't have the inventory with me in Arlington, then I sold two pieces from just showing them to her on my phone. That's great. Yeah. So, so what you're all saying uh, brings up this point that sometimes people want us to basically to sell to them. Well, to like guide them, asking, to guide yeah. them on their purchase. Yes, because they're not designers. They don't, and we can make suggestions. Like for example, with what Erica was saying, do we, do you want to do multiple pieces based on color? Well, you can make a suggestion that way, or do they want to do it based on horizontal vertical, or do they want to base it based on where the picture was taken, or there's other factors that come into play that most people don't have a lot of experience, but we learn going through shows, being in people's homes when we deliver pieces, help hang their work. We learn possible ways to show people how our work can hang in ways that they haven't considered. So, you know, and maybe they like a piece but it needs to be more horizontal you can suggest well i can do this piece here and we can crop it down and it'll fit that space better you can make a lot of powerful suggestions paying attention to what they're saying thinking about the space they have and then most of the time i think they're going to be open to suggestions as erica and allison are saying so yeah i make offers i don't sell them but but i make offers if they like one piece i go I might say, well, this goes really good with this piece. And then I leave it there, you know, put plant it in their head. I generally like one one or three. The two, eh, but three seems to go good together. So that's what I would try and do. The three. Yeah. How about you, Larry, from your experience, what, what would you add? Well, I used to price single price and then three, four. Yeah. Oh. What do you mean by single price and three and four? Well, um, 45, three for a hundred. Oh. Like that. But your yeah. matted work, not your. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. But even on, even yeah. the pricing I have for the prints that I sell, um, I just sold three 11 by 14 prints of Jerry Garcia last week. <laughs> Sweet. Um, they're 75, three for 150 on my website. For 11 by 14, Madden? Yeah, no, no mat, just rolled up. They cost me 10 bucks a piece. And another thought, Jason, is um, to the extent that the, the whoever is doing your printing for you, uh, if you can do custom sizes, is that if people are kind of resistant and they go like, well, that one seems a little small, that one maybe that's a little too big i don't know pay attention because if you can custom size them tell them that that yes we can custom size it because that will often make the sale for you as they realize oh oh okay it's adjustable so totally yeah i want to take out as many frictions as i can from the uh buying experience removing the speed bumps it's a great straight way to do it and and never be offended when people say oh my you know, grandson, mother, brother, uncle, does something just like this. Well, I'm trying. Or where I'd say are you great. Going next week? I'd say yeah. great. That's where you go without whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, one thing I'm trying to do is, and Larry knows this, I'm, my photography is about combining mountain climbing with photography. So I'm trying oh. to personalize as much as I can within my booth, like having some small pictures of me on the side on a cliff of a mountain. Uh, That's great. That's so, that that is wonderful. It, personalizing it, it brings it all together. It's the reason why you photograph those mountains. So hopefully people will see that as a as unique. I guess we'll find out. And you can have a drone. 
back on the side too or something. Yeah. So yeah, it was be partially because of you, Barry, that I updated my artist <coughs> statement to say that no drone uh, usage is, is used in my photography whatsoever. Oh, really? <laughs> cool. That's something I never <laughs> thought about that I sh should have been more upfront about. I don't, I don't think that matters. I mean, people use drones to do that. They don't think about it. You know? Yeah, but the if, fact that he's hiking those, he's it, there. it just... Yeah, yeah good luck. <laughs> I think that's great, and it's also it uh, a great. good a good icebreaker, you know, because there sure. are other people who, you know, people buy art because they relate to it, and so that adds a very personal dimension. Yeah, and, the, and all my big pieces I have, I'm getting a, a plaque order that goes under every big piece that describes what the mountain climb involved and all that type of stuff. See, I, I think as as a non mountain climber, I mean, I like hiking, but I'm not a mountain climber. I going into your booth, I'd find that interesting, and I I would stay in the booth longer just to read those. So, Jason, are you going to do those plaques in mini metal underneath the big metal? Yes. So they're actually going to be like a four by twelve, um, right around there. Um, and then, yeah, it would, it would have that under all the major pieces. Okay, so your production company is going to print what you send them in text on the metal? Yeah, yeah. So I literally send them a, a file that has the, the image description. They put it on metal. It's super cheap. I don't, oh, maybe like $10 per 4x12 or around there. And uh, So that's why you should be doing your booth sign like that. Yeah, like similar style? Oh, yeah. The only problem with that is the wear and tear that the booth sign will get. Oh, yeah, but it doesn't matter. He's not selling it. Right, so, but you can't have a booth sign that looks lousy after a while. You know, you have to replace it, and it's probably expensive in the booth size. It. Shrink wrap it. Well, I have to take off, everybody. Do well, and Jason, I look forward to hearing from you down the road, and Kaylee, good luck with all those Comic Cons out there. Brian, good to see you. Do you have any shows coming up? Um, in yeah, starting in two weeks, I do um, I think seven or eight in a row, and then Ooh. have a week oh. off, and then go to Central Pennsylvania. And kind of start wow. What program. what states are those uh, two months that you're doing uh, in a row? Mostly Illinois and Ohio, and um, then going into Pennsylvania and um, Michigan. So, yeah. So I'll be rooting for you at Arlington. Do well. Yeah. Yes. And Don't make sure you come, come back to the call so you can tell us about what's going on in <laughs> Ohio and Illinois and Michigan. Yeah. If you ever yeah. do see a big margarita glass next to me, you'll know they're not going particularly well. So, <laughs> and Larry, oh, a pleasure. Thank you for having this. Hey, Ron, on your way to State College, you can stop by my house. I will. I will. If you don't mind, that'd be great. No, Look not forward to meeting you, seeing you again, uh, in person again. Yeah. And meet the dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can Personable. hear her in the background. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Ron. Bye, Ron. All right, everybody. Well, thank you uh, so much for all the uh, the insight. I, uh, it's been a overwhelming but exciting uh, journey at the same time. So. Oh, one last thing, one last thing. This works for me anyway. I, every time you do a show, there's a bunch of the same things you're gonna have to bring. So make a basic craft show list of things that you need, and then you could keep adding to it, print it out you know, before you do a show. And then um, it's just a, a good way to make sure you don't forget anything. And uh, you know, even though I've been doing shows for a long time, I still, change things around or have to add to it, but it just, it just makes it, it makes me more confident that I'm not forgetting anything. I still forget stuff. <laughs> listen, I'll have it sitting out right here, you know, <laughs> to go out the door and I get to the show and I go, no, wait a minute. I put it right in my way. I wasn't going to forget it. And I also look around to see if I <laughs> forgot something and I still forget it. It's just part of the thing or part of my charm, I guess. I don't know. Uh -huh. That list helps me. Yeah, dedicated vehicle solves all of that. Yes. And my, my favorite thing is, oh, I'll stop and get 
should I go get paint now? Because I, I have walls that need to be painted. Uh, should I go get the paint now? Oh, I'll just get it on the way. I never stop on the way. I have to get everything beforehand. You know, you know. I pass. I might pass a hundred. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Office Max or um, you know, uh, those uh, Home Depot. I'll pass hundreds of them, and I never stop. Even though, oh, I, this will be really easy. I'll just go and get off the highway and go there and be on my way. Nah, it doesn't happen. So I always have to get it beforehand. You know, even if it's a paint roller, I really have to, I have to get everything beforehand. You know? And boy, I wish the price of vehicles would go down because I'd come and do the Colorado events, but I'm afraid with my, uh, you know, I could have the Beverly Hillbillies theme playing outside my vehicle because it's that. It's a it's a U upper peninsula special, which means that it it's all rusted out on the bottom. So uh, it'd be like listening to my story about a man named Jed. <laughs> so that's how I feel when I get to a show, and and you know I, I I'm doing I'm doing fine now, and I I could easily get a new vehicle, but the prices are ridiculous. So you know keeps me from coming to Colorado and doing those events. <laughs> I'll hold it so, down. The, here, here's my. This is for Old Town, <laughs> and um, so I've got a checklist. If I need to actually uh, get buy something ahead of time, I have need and have a place for notes, and uh, you know, just simple. And you know, each show gets one. I could put the show the show name on the top, and uh, you know, I, I, I've got to make sure I have my coffee beans and my um, coffee thermos. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> oh, and yeah, beans are important. The, the most important thing on this list is the jewelry because you know the <laughs> the the the, the, the artist anxiety dream right is you're always going to forget the item that you actually make <laughs> so i have it hey. i have it in all caps on this list <laughs> okay i want to hear from people what is the biggest thing that they've actually forgotten to go to a show my paperwork <laughs> paperwork I once forgot my tent sides. That was early on in Park City. And, you know, that's the thing. Artists are so resourceful, too. Yeah. I, had, I, I got tent sides from four different artists. And a lot of people bring extra. Yeah. I, I yeah, forgot I my always, top. I forgot <laughs> and I had, had, I had extra craft type pieces. I had somebody go into my studio and get it and send, and, uh, and send it to me because I had forgotten the top. Well, I'll try to make sure I don't do these things. So, uh, Allison, your list will will prove to be very fruitful. It's inevitable, Jason. I know, I'm sure. But well, it's, just remember, it's okay. But most things you could either borrow or buy, and and seriously, artists are so resourceful. I mean, for for most things that you would need at a show. <laughs> yeah. Actually, right. one one time. I saw an artist who was at the same show as me. He posted this jalapeno margarita that he was drinking. And I said, I would love if you bring me one. And I don't normally drink at a show. And it went till eight o'clock in the evening. And he actually brought me this jalapeno margarita, which is, it was, it was delicious. I, I, it didn't sound good to me, but, um, but that was through Facebook that we both posted. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I got my Facebook site stolen, and it's been two months because uh, I won't I won't go back on and uh, or I haven't. I probably will do another one eventually, but I don't miss it. I'm okay without the social networking. It's great, you know, all that petty nonsense that you know that goes back and forth and the political nonsense. And sometimes I don't want to know what people think that I'm friends with. I don't know what I don't want to know what they think because it'll mess the mess up the friendship. So it's actually worked worked really well that I don't you know that I'm not on there. Well, uh, I, I unfortunately have to run, but just want to say thank you again. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for all the words of wisdom. So uh, first shows Memorial <laughs> Memorial Day, and then uh, we'll go from there. Good luck. Yeah. Bye, everybody. See you soon. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Larry.
Thanks, Larry. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Yes, it's over. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs>